Okay, I'm here with Dr. Reese Holter in San Francisco, and today we're going to talk about Arctic sea ice. There's a lot of talk at the moment around how it's disappearing and leaving an ice-free polar region, so it's a very current issue. Hello, Reese. How are you? How are you, Nick? I'm really well, thank you. It's good to talk good. to you again. Yes. And can you just start off by telling us why is ice so important? Mostly ice is of great import uh, on planet Earth because it's, it's uh, as close to white and pure white as, as we can get, although all the dust and schmutz in the air uh, slightly dampens the pure white. But it's a reflective color, Nick, and it's Earth's way of reflecting the incoming solar radiation and ultimately keeping our planet within a habitable temperature range for human beings. So as right. we are losing more of it, uh, obviously uh, with rising greenhouse gases, the atmosphere is, is getting all the warmer. Okay, okay. And how is rapid Arctic ice melt affecting the UK, for example? Because, you know, it's starting to come in the news here. Yeah, well, what, what we're seeing, and we've seen this for the last uh, three, uh, almost four winters, is the, the lack of ice in the Arctic is directly affecting the polar jet stream. I mean, basically, what's happening is the Arctic Ocean is able to, uh, because more of it is exposed, it's a much darker color, obviously, than the white ice, it's absorbing a lot of energy. In fact, the Arctic Ocean is at least one degree centigrade warmer than we thought it was a couple years ago. And that energy is being fed into the atmosphere without the ice capping it and containing it and holding it. And, and so instead of the polar jet stream, which usually has about seven tight loops around the top of the earth remaining in those tight little loops the um, jet stream is starting to meander way way far south we saw last summer right. in the uk torrential torrential flooding which right, is yeah. directly now associated with the the meandering uh, polar jet stream and we're starting to see the very late seasonal cold and in the north of the UK snowy conditions are are once again linked to this meandering jet stream which in turn is linked to the reduction in the ice in the arctic which in turn is linked to the rise in greenhouse carbon fuel gases yes yeah okay okay is there anything at all, I mean, obviously, if this gets worse, it's going to impact all kinds of things. Is there anything we can do to stop it or reverse it even? Yeah, there, there are a lot of things that we can do. Geoengineering is high on the list. And the uh, Arctic Methane Emergency Group, AMEG, has yeah. got, in my opinion, the most practical solution, and that being, in my opinion, to infuse seawater into a mist into the atmosphere to try and create uh, white clouds that will act as uh, a reflector up in the Arctic and to try and prevent the, the jet stream from meandering and try and keep the, the Arctic in a cooler condition. It, it's warming at least two or three times faster than any place on the planet. It's not good, Nick. But if you're talking about geoengineering and cloud seeding or, or cloud brightening, I think it's called, isn't it? They're, yeah. And Stephen Salter in Edinburgh is working on a project there. I mean, this technology doesn't exist at the moment. It's being developed and researched, but it doesn't actually exist. And there's a lot of people against geoengineering. They're saying, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't tamper with the Earth's natural climate system. But how would you respond to that? Really? Well... I got news for the mate. Since the industrial revolution, we've been we've been tampering with the atmosphere. All right, we're pounding out so many greenhouse gases that we have irrefutably changed the chemistry of our planet. So it's a little bit late to start to say, well, we better not muck around with anything. I think that we've got to do something because these droughts in um, the Midwest of America and down into middle America and over into Australia and 
other grain growing, corn growing uh, regions of the planet are beginning to widen. So I don't believe that we can sit by. Do you don't think we can watch. just, um, you know, you don't think the earth will right itself? Oh, the earth will right itself, but it, it, this, it, this is all about human beings and this is, everything's about us. And, you know, will it right itself in six months or 18 months? I wouldn't bet that <laughs> sure. at all. Will it right itself in 10,000 or 20,000 years? Or I'm sure it will find a new normal, but I'm not sure that that's going to help people who want to have breakfast in 18 months. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so what can each of us do as individuals? Because this is what it often comes down to. So what can we do as individuals to try and slow this climate change down? Yeah, um, I, I, I think more that... Uh, each of us, in fact, have a, a lot that we can offer. I think that getting a, a uh, energy uh, assessment or footprint of our homes, figuring out uh, where we're spending energy. I think a lot of this boils down to simply changing a few habits, Nick, to yeah. start with. We're not talking about going and outfitting your home with micro windmills or uh, solar panels, which most families at this time can't. But I think that if if we're careful in how we're spending uh, our energy, I think that that's a terrific start. I think also if uh, people walk and ride their bikes to do chores that are less than uh, two miles away, I think that that's a, a terrific start. I think that by simply going online, to any number of sites and, and finding out what an energy audit for your home is, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's a really important step because, look, a, a, a pound saved is a pound earned. Yeah. And uh, there isn't a family that I know that wouldn't like to save 100 or 200 pounds a month uh, by simply changing a few habits, whether that's shutting off lights, whether that's uh, being careful on how you spend your water. Don't forget, before last summer in the UK, the mm -hmm. UK was in a ripping drought, okay. and uh, they were actually concerned with how, for a time, how they were going to wash the uh, double-decker buses for the Olympics because there wasn't enough water. So <laughs> sure, yeah. I, I think the careful use of water. I, uh, I also think that for families, it's, it's springtime. I encourage whether you live in a flat or whether you don't have much of a yard, yeah. get a couple pots and get a couple tomato and a couple pepper plants and, uh, and grow them in a pot. And there's a couple things you'll achieve. One is in eight weeks from the time that you plant, you're going to get the bounty of, of the tomatoes, tomatoes and, and peppers. And two, you're, you're providing a, a safe source of nectar and pollen for the bumblebees. Please, no one wants to use any pesticides or herbicides or miticides or fungicides in the garden because we know that those will hurt the bees and the bees are in trouble. So this way we can get some food. And if people do have a yard, we're encouraging on Monday, it's Earth Day, for uh, each family to plant uh, a fruit tree. An apple tree in the UK would be terrific. That, that becomes a wonderful food in a couple years when the trees are, are uh, mature and begin to throw their fruit. It's yeah, also yeah. a safe haven and source for nectar for all of the bees, the urban areas. What, about, what can we do as individuals in terms of responding to what politicians say? Because they respond to us. And yeah, a well, that's uh, excellent. Uh, I mean, rip off a, a fast. I certainly would encourage emailing your uh, local member of parliament and, and just saying, hey, look, we, we've got to get a handle on this. We've got to reduce our yeah. dependency on carbon fuels. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, it does boil down to one thing. Our best friend in the 21st century, Nick, is innovation. The road to innovation is efficiency. Efficiency really is changing a few habits. My biggest gripe with supporting uh, big oil, big coal, and big gas is they have no interest in innovations for the future. They are actually the bottleneck and they are thwarting our future by sneering and preventing innovation. 
innovation is where it's at. 40 years ago, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, when they came up with the idea of Apple, if everyone told them no forever, we would have no tablets, no Macintosh, no smartphones. So innovation, brother. Yep. Okay. I've got you. One more question that's quite interesting. As the situation accelerates and climate change is impacting you know, agriculture and even production of wine, which you know, I read quite a bit about, there seems to be predictions about, well, this winery will have to move up here and these people will move over here and, and this production will shift here. And, that, and that's implying that we're going to adapt to climate change. I mean, how do you feel about adapting to climate well, change? Well, I, I think we, you know, I think we're going to have no other choice. It's just we're trying to contend with seven plus billion people and uh, our, our demand for chocolate, our demand for coffee, our demand for wine, and our demand for, for basic food stuffs are all grown in regions that depend upon uh, temperatures and predictable rainfall. Yeah. So, yes, you know, we're going to have to adapt. Will we all be able to adapt? Uh, that's the $64,000 question right now. And, and And actually, one last thing, it does play into what uh, Prince Charles has been talking about for years, and that is future-proofing. And as far as I'm concerned, all of our governments and all of our towns and cities very seriously need to be strongly on the future-proofing program to protect all of, our, all of the citizens. Do you think as well, with going back to the Arctic sea ice and as the polar region warms up... Um, because it's quite clean air up there, so you know it, it gets a lot of harsh sunlight in the summer months. As that region warms up and Greenland starts to to warm as well, I mm. mean you're you're starting to get bigger you know, iceberg carving runoff. Yep. What's the impact on coastal areas from that? Well, yeah, it, there's certainly rising sea level, and and to to what extent? Again, that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Uh, it is right. It has been rising. It will continue to rise, and in the decades ahead, that too will become a, a very serious issue because higher sea levels, coupled with extreme weather events, uh, tend to bring storms on shore w that we've seen with a lot more power and, and more water. Yeah. So that's you know that again is a a problem, and the other thing we're watching is as um, the temperatures rise, the atmosphere is able to hold more moisture. So when it rains, we're tending to get these uh, intense deluges, That's right, which yeah. also cause flooding. Okay. Well, thanks. I mean, I think we could go on and on here, but I'm going to call it a day today, and we'll come back and revisit some of these topics again. Terrific. Um, but thanks very much, Reese. It's been really good. Cheers, to Nick. Take care. Okay. Right Bye. Bye.